Welcome everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here with you. My name is Angie and my husband Larry and I live in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And we've been teaching classes since 2004 in communities all over North America. Most likely your host for today has taken one or more of our classes and has also feels compelled to help provide this, the exposure to this education for people that they know, love and care about. So we're so glad to have you. Um, I've provided for your host a couple of things, uh, two printouts and a consumer awareness guide. Uh, the first is really for note taking. Uh, most likely there's going to be material covered today that you're not familiar with. Uh, this will help you to follow along and also for sure to have something to review after class. Uh, the second printout is for at the end of class, um, there will be options for you to indicate if you would like further information or resources for some of the things that we discuss in class, there will be an option for you to indicate it there. For instance, if you're a healthcare professional and you would like to pursue continuing medical education courses, uh, you can indicate it and your host can direct you to those sources and even help you with some discount on them. Um, the consumer awareness guide is basically for you to take home. If you are supplementing with uh, vitamins and minerals, it will help you to learn the difference between natural and synthetic and why it matters. So people always wonder and ask us why do, have we, why do we teach these classes and why actually we change the whole course of our lives to teach these classes. Um, by the time I was 28 years old, I had already miscarried six times. I had always considered myself so healthy. I couldn't imagine uh, that I was, had anything but a healthy life, a healthy lifestyle. Um, but every year became more and more apparent that my immune system was not functioning well. I did what I thought everyone should do, go to the doctor, and even though I had wonderful doctors who did the best that they could for me, I continued to decline and over the years I ended up just accumulating more and more doctors, more and more medications, and became more and more physically stressed. Never, never did I feel that the quality of my life was improving in spite of my doctors and my best efforts. Uh, what Larry and I came to understand impacted my life so significantly that we feel compelled to share this education, at least provide exposure for it, so that people can make a decision that they feel is best for themselves based on education, not marketing hype, marketing deception, or TV commercials. Um, I'm so grateful that my husband is an educator. He taught at the university for many years, a graduate and undergraduate studies. He put himself in search of answers, of truth, of, of seeking help for me. Or, well, honey, I want you to share what it is that you did. Angie and I met and married uh, two years after I graduated from the United States Air Force Academy and I was attending graduate school at the University of Missouri. Um, the first 10 years, as she mentioned, um, everything seemed to be okay except for the miscarriages. She seemed to be pretty healthy, but um, after that 10-year point, uh, the next 15 years, she started to confront more and more health challenges and she started to really deteriorate. Um, I was concerned, I didn't know what to do. Uh, she was in pain, she, it just seemed like everything was breaking down. Nothing was getting better, everything was falling apart. Um, I was frustrated, I didn't know what else to do, so I just immersed myself in study and research. I was looking for solutions, I was looking for clues, I was just looking for a glimmer of hope, uh, something that could help her. Um, what I discovered, amazed me. Um, and so this is what drives us to share this education throughout the world to all the communities that we can. Um, and this class uh, will provide an overview of what we've come to learn over those years. So let's get started.
True wellness encompasses many parts. There's not just one component to having wellness in your life. There are many different parts. I always felt that I had all these parts in place. I was doing all the right things. I never participated in illegal drugs. I didn't even consume alcohol. I never smoked cigarettes. I, I, I didn't do these things that I was told were things that could be harmful to your health. Um, I be, was proactive in that I was taught water aerobics for many, many years. I participated in planting a garden with our family each spring and we ate from the produce of our garden. Um, I uh, became uh, always, of course, uh, cooked from scratch because my mom cooked from scratch. So I came from a background of, of eating whole real food as much as possible. But the more concerned that I got with my health, I even took it a step, step further and started to do things like, you know, cut out soda and never eating at fast foods and all of those things. I didn't even consume caffeine because I was not having the quality of life that I yearned for. Um, I didn't know what else to do. I was very happy with my large family. I always wanted a large family. I had such joy and fulfillment in my marriage. My spiritual life was in place. So I had all of these components. Um, but then it came to the fact that we learned that the very foundation of our food has been altered. This completely shocked me. I had no idea what are the ramifications of the fact that our food has been altered and is not what we think. Beginning uh, around World War II, uh, a philosophy uh, developed uh, called Better Living Through Chemistry. And uh, we started to change the whole food that we were eating into what I call edible food-like substances. These are things that are boxed, bagged, sacked, packaged, um, wrapped uh, in uh, containers that, uh, if you look at the back of it, they have ingredients with a lot of chemistry names that go on and on and on. Um, this food is devoid of nutrition, and so when you process it, you need to fortify and enrich it because it doesn't have any of the living nutrition. For example, we take a, a kernel of wheat, which you'll see this picture on the bottom left. Um, you can see the brown part on the left is the bran, the green on the bottom is the germ, and the endosperm is uh, right above the germ in a kind of a speckled uh, color. And uh, when we used to grind the whole uh, kernel, um, this flour would actually go bad in about seven days. That's because when you expose the, the living oils uh, in the bran and the germ, they will oxidize and the flour will go rancid. Um, good food goes bad in time. Uh, bad food stays bad. Uh, and you may have noticed that our flour today doesn't uh, go bad and can sit on store shelves for quite a long time. That's because we strip the bran and the germ from the kernel and we just use the endosperm when we uh, uh, grind our flour. Uh, when you do that, you've removed uh, 20 nutrients from your food. Uh, we feel bad when we do that, so we add five of those back synthetically. Um, 20 out, five back in, probably not a really good deal. The picture in the middle shows how we fortify with iron. We take our cereals and we add iron to them. Uh, there are demonstrations on YouTube where you can see um, folks who will take um, uh, flakes of cereal, they'll put it in this bowl of water and they'll pass a magnet and they'll actually drag the flake around um, anywhere they want in the bowl. That's how much magnetic iron there is in it. Uh, they also, you'll see the blender on the far right, um, they will take uh, cereal, um, for example, baby rice cereal, and they'll put it in uh, the blender, add water, mix it up, and then pour that mixture into a, a bag, a Ziploc bag, uh, tie that off and pass a magnet across it, and they will actually gather all of the metal shavings uh, in the corner of the bag, and you'll see uh, the magnet has gathered these uh, iron shavings that look like whiskers on that food particle, that's what's in your food. Um, when I first saw that, I thought, this has got to be illegal. How can 
people get away adding uh, metal into your food. How much of that metal do you think actually gets digested in your uh, digestive tract? Um, not very much. Uh, and so these are the faces of um, malnourishment that we've seen. The one here on the left uh, is one that we typically associate with uh, children who are malnourished. The one on the right may seem unfamiliar, but it is more and more common, especially in Western uh, uh, countries where we've developed a lot of this processed food. It is devoid of nutrition. We eat and eat and eat more of it, but we're not getting the nutrient value. We gain calories. And so we are overfed, but malnourished. Even if we try to eat uh, whole foods, our whole foods have lost a lot of their nutritional value due to things like green harvesting and soil depletion. Um, if you look at peaches, um, in 1951, it only took two peaches to meet the minimum RDA level of vitamin A. Uh, today, uh, in 1999, when the study was uh, conducted and finished, it took 53 peaches to make that same minimum RDA. Iron, uh, one cup of spinach in 1951 would do that, but in 1999, it takes 65 cups of spinach to meet that minimum level. And our food has continued to decline since 1999. We've done things uh, to our food besides um, uh, losing nutrient value. We've, we've hybridized our food. Hybridization is when you take um, two uh, plants uh, like roses, uh, and you marry them together and create a child offspring. For example, the plant uh, in this picture at the top has purple flowers. If you marry it or breed it naturally with another plant that has yellow flowers, the offspring plant can have purple and yellow flowers. So that can be beneficial when you're talking about flowers. However, we turned our attention from flowers to food and when we started to hybridize wheat in the late 1940s, early 1950s, there were some wonderful goals that we were trying to achieve, but there were some dire consequences as well. We were looking to increase the yield of our wheat to get more kernels on it. We were looking to make it drought resistant so we could um, uh, plant this crop in more arid countries. We were looking to enhance the dough properties. Um, but when you do uh, this hybridization on wheat, 95% of the proteins that are expressed in that wheat um, are in the child uh, wheat. They are the same ones that were in the parent wheat. But 5% are brand new. They're unique. They never existed in either parent. So for the first time, they show up in the child. Now, if you hybridize your wheat tens of times, it's probably not a big deal. But in this country, we have hybridized our wheat hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of times. And so the wheat we have today is vastly different genetically. We have changed our wheat. Uh, we have increased the yield. Um, but that taller plant that you see on the bottom uh, corner uh, picture uh, has had to change uh, its dimensions until you get down to the one on the far right. The, the, the weight of the kernels was so much that it snapped the taller stalk, and so we had to re-engineer the stalk to make it shorter, bulkier, in order to hold the load. So all of this was done with minimal uh, human and animal testing. Um, it just wasn't required because it seemed like natural things. And the wheat looked like wheat, and so nobody suspected differences. Today, um, if you look at a picture uh, from the uh, 1800s, this top picture, you'll see a farmer, uh, you'll see his face and uh, is holding his hat in his hand, uh, waving it at the photographer, and you can see that that's very tall wheat. Um, today's farmer actually kneels down next to his wheat plant, and you can see that it's a lot shorter than it used to be in the 1800s. So we've altered that wheat dramatically. It's actually standing um, only 12 to 18 inches, and it's called dwarf and semi-dwarf wheat. And that wheat represents 99% of worldwide production. So it's out there everywhere. And when we look back as to what has changed, the, the major component that has changed in this wheat from the original wheat is the gluten. 
the gluten proteins have changed, and what are the ramifications for that kind of change? Do you know anybody who has sensitivity to gluten? Do you know anybody who has to remove wheat from their diet because they no longer can eat that wheat? The staff of life uh, and large numbers of people are unable to eat that wheat. Um, gluten is what uh, affects the elasticity, the chewiness, of, uh, the, uh, and helps it to rise the, the dough and makes these wonderful tasty uh, breads. Um, but when you look into this gluten, one of the components is something called a protein called gliadin, and uh, that's made up of a subcomponent called gluteomorphin. And gluteomorphin actually crosses the blood-brain barrier and docks on opiate receptors in the brain cells. And so when they dock there, they um, don't have as dramatic an effect as morphine or heroin, but they have a similar effect in that you start to crave this um, ingredient. And so addictions start to arise uh, out of this chemical interaction. And so you can find uh, there are studies out there that show that people who have this and eat this and have that attachment to their brain cells will actually um, eat 400 more calories per day. Um, just a, a huge uh, increase in what they want to eat because they feel compelled to eat it. Um, if you take this wheat and look at it in terms of uh, glycemic levels, it turns out that we thought whole wheat was the healthy alternative, but this wheat is much different. And when you eat this wheat, um, you can actually uh, increase the glycemic level to higher levels than uh, sucrose does, a tablespoon of sugar. Uh, I can eat a Snicker bar and have a lower glycemic level than eating whole wheat bread. In fact, I can eat white bread and have a slightly lower glycemic index than if I eat the wheat bread. And that information is definitely not out to the public who thinks that um, uh, eating wheat is the best alternative. Um, the old wheat was a great alternative. This newer wheat uh, has some issues with it. And that was natural breeding. Uh, genetically modified food, or GMO, um, is not so natural. What we do is we take the genes of one species and we inject it into uh, an entirely different species. Um, for example, we take the genes of this bacteria, which I'll abbreviate BT, and I have a picture here on the left, on the bottom, and we take those genes and we insert it into the, uh, every cell of the corn. Uh, when we do that, um, it actually uh, explodes the gut of the pests who uh, eat that corn. So the butterflies and moths, it pretty much eliminates that problem. But what are the ramifications for when people eat that? So again, animal and human trial studies um, that were not done to the degree that uh, agricultural scientists were doing, they weren't medical uh, folks, and so that testing never was really adequately done. In addition, we have modified our soybeans to tolerate increased sprays of the, uh, the weed killer, um, a popular weed killer that we have. And uh, the problem or issue with that is when you feed that a modified soybean to animals. They show alterations in their liver, pancreatic, uh, intestinal, and testicular tissue when you compare them to animals eating uh, non-GMO uh, soybean. So that's brought up the issue of labeling uh, your food. Um, people want to know if it contains these genetically modified organisms. Uh, and it's important because in the U.S., the soybean production is now 94% GMO. Corn in the United States, 88% of that production is GMO. And uh, so that uh, corn goes into corn syrup and high fructose corn syrup, and that is in 70% of processed food. So that is already in the food supply, and people are unaware of it. Um, people um, understand that what you eat um, eating is the most intimate thing that you ever do because what you eat actually becomes you and that's as intimate as it gets. Uh, we're not just filling up for energy. We're not putting gas in a gas tank. You actually build the gas tank with the food that you eat. 
So these issues are important and people have a right to know. So recognizing that even the whole real food that I thought I was eating was not in some cases what my body was even designed to recognize. Uh, it had these serious limitations. So what are the consequences of this? Why is it that I could not improve the quality of my life for all my effort? My best eating wasn't really good enough. No wonder that I continued to decline every year. I really began to question if I could even help myself simply by eating better. This led us to more and more seeking, more and more research, and more and more study. For many years, my six doctors, four of them who were specialists, did everything that they could, continuing to try to help me uh, to have better quality of life, and yet it wasn't helping me, and I just didn't want to take any more uh, medications. I yearned to have my health back. I wanted to be well. Every day I wanted to be well. So I sought the help from a very well-respected nutritionist, and she helped me to know what I should supplement with. Uh, I paid her $400 a month, and over the years I was incorporating 50 different supplements, along with some of my medications from my physicians also. Um, but still I continued to decline until I feared for my life. I could not understand why all that I was taking wasn't helping me, or at least wasn't helping me enough. Why was this? This set my husband into more studying and more searching. So I want my uh, Larry to share with you what it is that he came to understand and to learn. So honey? Part of the reason why she wasn't receiving any help was because uh, the vitamins that she was taking were synthetic. Um, synthetic vitamins are made from coal tar, they're man-made. You can see a picture over here of a guy spreading coal tar on the asphalt. Uh, that's the base 